Thank you. Um, as Mariva said, the title of my talk is Spatial Density Maps from a Debris Cloud. Uh, so the basic problem that we want to think about here is where are the concentrations of debris and how long do they stay in a particular place when you have some fragmentation event. So we're, a lot of people are accustomed to thinking of terrestrial debris and think of, and I've even heard references to uh, people talking about space debris as a debris field and in the terrestrial context that's really just a pile of debris that sits in a place. So we'd like to know, are there in space, are there concentrations of density? Do these concentrations persist in uh, certain locations? Um, and what of this pattern of concentrated debris is due to the dynamics and what is due to the initial velocity distribution? So we're going to understand this uh, um, pattern of debris of spatial density by doing an exact calculation. Um, so our view is going to be of inertial space with a density, so a function over inertial space with a density at a particular time, uh, instead of our traditional view of orbital ephemeris, where we follow a single particle, a single satellite, and look at that position in inertial space over time. So in the language of fluid dynamics, this is a shift from the Lagrangian view to the Eulerian view. And in this uh, technique for calculating, there is no relative motion approximation. There's no assumption of Gaussian distribution uh, or any other approximation. There's no sampling or Monte Carlo distribution. This is an exact solution. Uh, the technique that we use for this is the transformation of variables technique. And that basically tells you that if you have a function from one space to another, it tells you how to uh, calculate the transformation of a density in one space indicated by the capital G here to uh, the density in another space. And it, it is based on this uh, simple sum here, which is the sum over all the, uh, I'm trying to figure out the laser here. Oh, here. The sum over all the inverse images of this function capital F of the density divided by the absolute value of the Jacobian determinant. The Jacobian is the matrix of partial derivatives of the transformation. Uh, and so in the context of this problem, we're going from a space of velocities, which is a three-dimensional space, uh, at a particular time at the fragmentation point R1 to a later time at any arbitrary point R2 uh, to into the spatial uh, space. So physical space. Um, and that is the Lambert problem, solved many times over. Uh, and we use the Batten's hypergeometric method for solving this problem. We solve a variable x, which is always greater than minus 1. Um, and, to get the, and from that, you can get the full initial velocity, r1. You can also get the partial derivatives, which are the elements of the Jacobian matrix. Those were worked out by Batten. And in a paper published last year, Nitin Aurora uh, provided a, a very straightforward algebraic series of calculations to do that. The Jacobian determinant, which is in that denominator, has units of cubic time, uh, and they're typically values around 10 to the 10th cubic seconds. So when you divide that into a density and velocity space, you get a density in position space, which is what we want. Uh, now, this is a little bit different than the traditional Lambert solution because usually the Lambert problem is stated as give me a solution between these two uh, points at, um, for the given elapsed time. We have to, for this to work, we have to have all of them. So you could call this the total Lambert problem. So we need all these inverse images and you can identify all the different uh, possible Lambert solutions with this. Uh, what I'll call Lambert modes, which is the number of whole orbits starting with zero or some positive number. Uh, you have the short way and the long way in the Lambert solution. And uh, if you have a positive n here, there are actually two solutions uh, that are for each of the short and long way that are greater than the minimum time. There's always a minimum time with the uh, n greater than one solutions. So there are a total, you could call it two n max plus one solutions. And these are mathematical solutions. I want to distinguish mathematical solutions from physical solutions because they solve the differential equation. Um, but we may have a problem in that, or not a problem, but an advantage in that a particular solution 
strikes the Earth over the trajectory, and so it's not actually a physical solution. And finally, if you're um, intending to have high enough velocities, you have to consider parabolic and hyperbolic orbits as well. So uh, the way we go about calculating this density map is we uh, go through every pixel uh, on the picture and say that's our R2, and for each elapsed time, and we calculate uh, all these inverse images, the velocity R1 dot and the determinant of the Jacobian. Uh, we look up that corresponding initial velocity distribution. So we now have a velocity R1 dot, and we look up in our distribution function of velocity uh, and do that math, basically, and then calculate the density, turn that into a color scale, and put it on a uh, picture, in a picture. And with each time step, we can make a movie out of that. So uh, to, to answer this question of what, where are the highest concentrations, we can, we can set a threshold, calculate the volume above that threshold uh, at each time step, and look at that uh, amount of that volume as it changes over time. To, to try to answer the question of persistence, we look at the points which exceed the threshold and also exceeded the threshold on the previous time step. Uh, and so you can consider that some measure of persistence. Uh, and then we'll plot that over time as well. So uh, to do this study, we consider two uh, initial velocity distributions. One is a very simple one, you sometimes call the top hat, uh, which is a constant velocity distribution up to a maximum. In this case, a maximum of two, um, a delta, I should say delta V, a maximum of two kilometers per second. Uh, it is isotropic in delta V, it's not isotropic in velocity, because remember we have to add it to the initial velocity of the source uh, orbit, which is a 900 kilometer altitude circular orbit. So it looks something like this uh, with a step function drop off at two kilometers per second. The second one is the NASA Evolve distribution, which is an exponential in the log of delta V. Uh, in this case, we took an area to mass ratio of uh, 0.1 meters squared per kilogram. Uh, there's no maximum delta V, and it's isotropic in delta V, or it's assumed isotropic in delta V. So the density is computed in, in this case, in the original orbital plane uh, at 1920 by 1080, which is full HD. Uh, I think we can do this without reducing it. Whoops. So um, uh, that, that's not valid there. Uh, 24 kilometer spacing between the pixels. The Earth is going to be on the right-hand side of the picture because all the action, most of the actions you'll see is on the left side opposite where the fragmentation occurs. So the fragmentation will be at the very right-hand edge. Uh, and this video is first, the first eight hours, one second of the video is 15, second, 15 minutes of real time. And then it speeds up uh, up to 30 uh, by a factor of four and then goes to 36 hours. And there's a green dot which will show the preliminary orbit pre, prior to fa fragmentation. And then after fragmentation is a ghost satellite where, this, where the orbit would be. Uh, and the density is a zero logarithmic scale. So zero is black, and then as it shades up to blue, darker and brighter and brighter blue, it, it's a logarithmic scale, and then it becomes, uh, goes to white, uh, actually yellow, and then becomes white. Uh, it's logarithmic until it hits a maximum threshold. Okay. So could you show the top hat movie now? So here is the initial orbit. And you'll see once it hits the right-hand side, it starts a fragmentation. And it's a fairly uniform and high-density cloud, and it's spreading out. Here's your banana shape, even with the stem there. And we see that there's a, a line, antipodal line, opposite where the fragmentation occurred. There are bands forming. Of course, there's the pinch point, which is well known over on the right side. Um, as these bands form and it comes out, um, you'll see them get broader and start to overlap. Uh, there is also, notice this front edge here, which is high density. Now, this is where the speed up occurs. So um, as you go out, the density increases, and then it hits this sharp edge and then drops to zero. And this is true of each of the bands. There's kind of a band factory in here. You can think of it this way. As time goes on, these bands stretch out and they overlap. And at about 18 hours, which we've passed already, 
um, they sort of form a, a continuum there. <coughs> So, I have already said most of these things here. Uh, one of the reasons that you have, one of the ways you can think of that anti-pinch line uh, being a higher density is because there are more ways for it to get to the other side uh, when you have, when you're near where the side of the, of the pinch point, uh, the fragmentation point, um, there are, the earth blocks a lot of the solutions. So mathematically you can think of it that way. So that was the top hat distribution, which is the, is the two kilometers per second. This is the evolve, which is the exponential of uh, the logarithm of delta V. So could you start this movie? And note, try to take a look at the beginning. So we again have this initial uh, unfragmented orbit. Um, and look at how this forms and what happens and how it's different from uh, the previous one. If you look at this, you'll see now this continuous line here that moves out and fades away. And that really wasn't the case with the top hat. As time goes on, you'll see some similarities. You see these bands again, but um, you'll see differences in that, and this is indicative of this exponential distribution, that um, it starts to, um, well, as, as you get further out, there's no maximum here. So this line is, goes all the way out. Before, we had a cutoff here because uh, of that two kilometers per second as the maximum apogee. By the way, geo, geo is right about here on this scale. Notice this band of intense uh, density here. There's very little out here. It does go further, but this one is much higher density, which you would expect because the peak in that exponential is about 45 meters per second. It's fairly low, so uh, there's a lot more concentration on the inner orbits. So now we think about this area of concentrated risk and set a threshold of 10 to the minus 11th, say, and we'll set three different levels, 10 to the minus 11th, 10 to the minus 10th, and 10 to the minus 9. Um, and look at, this, look at the volume that exceeds that threshold. Look at its dependence in time and find this stable concentration area. And so this is for the top hat distribution. You can see this red line. Uh, there's a lot of transient, but it settles out into a constant one. The higher thresholds have a similar kind of behavior. Of course, they're lower total volume. Um, if you go to the evolve, there's uh, much more transient. And we even see in the 10 to the minus 11th, we don't quite see that settling yet. It's still kind of climbing. Here, you definitely see this settling into a steady state. And the persistence question is really interesting because it looks exactly the same. And it's after the initial transients, it's virtually all uh, stable stuff. So like the pinch point, you look around there, and that's clearly uh, a very stable location of density. And this, again, is for evolve. So it, again, it's, it has that pattern of, of, of almost uh, continuous uh, stable density. So in summary, we have, we can do this calculation exactly of where the density is from a fragmentation at a particular point. We simulated this on a 900 kilometer circular orbit um, for, two, for two different distributions. There's a lot of similar structures, the pinch point, the anti-pinch point, the bands, and so those are really common to the dynamics. And there are some things that are different which are specific to a particular uh, initial distribution. Uh, and the differences really are focused on that, uh, like we evolve with the exponential distribution, we get that much more concentrated near Earth, but then no maximum in how far it goes out. Um, so, and there's this persistence, which is very, um, there's, a, there's a, a stable areas of concentrated density that persist, um, so that, you could think of that as a debris field, but it's not, of course, it's not the same particles that are staying in one place. It's, it's just that they're getting replaced. Everything's moving, but it's getting replaced with uh, an equal amount of particles. So this is just a one-page summary of, of what I just said. Thank you. We do have time for questions. And... Uh... I'm never shy to ask anything, so, but go ahead. 
Yeah, first off, very cool work. Um, a question, would this uh, method be applicable to um, uh, simulate a fragmentation event uh, where it was two colliding, so you had a uh, rather than just the velocity around one. Yeah, so um, there's a lot, obviously, that you know I, I, I had to skip over. But yeah, absolutely. You could uh, imagine that, um, for instance, the assumptions, even without a collision, the assumption of isotropy here is not really valid, because you know when you have an explosion, it's actually asymmetric. Uh, and so yes, absolutely, uh, that's something that, with a model of any kind of model of delta v, you can put in there. Um, and, and I should also point out that the, the hard part of this calculation is Lambert solutions. And if you save those results, you can put in different models for the initial distribution that will, um, uh, you know, relatively re quick recalculation. And, and one more question. Sure. Uh, is there any, uh, would, would you suspect that there would be any difference between your results and the results found by, say, a Monte Carlo, you know, the, um, the more? Yeah, and, yeah, we have. So, so we actually started with a Monte Carlo, uh, and we saw these bands and said, hey, what's going on? And actually, we could, you can work out analytically from basic orbit mechanics why the bands are there. But we said, we, we need a better picture of how they change, and that's what got us into this. But uh, definitely, um, this is one of our, uh, uh, upcoming task is to go back to the Monte Carlo and do a more thorough validation to make sure we get all the, uh, you know, you have to get all the solutions and that would be a good check. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So yeah. in uh, real life, sometimes we see a busy week or two and then about six weeks of quiescent. Do you think your model's approaching real life when we're talking about m many months or years? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because what I, what I, I didn't say right. is, there's a couple of things here. One is you got to remember this is unperturbed dynamics. This is two-body motion only, and so perturbations are going to be important. And the second thing is the calculation gets slower and slower for longer and longer times. And I only went to 36 hours here. If you start to think about days, weeks, uh, it's, it's becoming less practical. And so there, there's obviously a need for uh, some kind of uh, different method that you could use this as a validation, but as a practical tool, you'd want to have something else. Cool. I guess uh, my question was, and you, you answered one of them with the dynamics, but when I looked at the plots, as a function of time, the intensity color seemed to remain constant. Yeah. So if you have a finite number of objects, how does the density remain constant? Okay, over that's time? a lot of people have that question. So um, f there are two things. One is this is only of the plane, and there's obviously a whole volume. The second is this is part of the, I don't want to say deception, but say the deception of a logarithmic plot. So you see these, blue, these dark blue areas spreading out. And you say, where is that stuff coming from, right? Because you have to cons conserve, it has to integrate to one. Right? So when you see that dark blue coming out, you've got to realize this is several orders of magnitude lower than the white area. And so that white area can be giving up, <laughs> so to speak, giving up density without you seeing it deplete in that scale. Excellent. Tom, if, if there's a chance for one more question if you wanted to. Yeah, I was just going to ask if you had, had plans to look at some representative distribution of area to mass ratios and incorporate that into what you're doing. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I didn't quite hear the whole question. Oh, I, I was wondering if you had plans to incorporate distribution of area to mass ratios in the propagation. Yeah, that method. would be a very interesting thing to do. So, so our, our first cut into, I mean, the, the top hat is not a realistic distribution. This is just to mm -hmm. kind of see what the, the, our first cut into a realistic distribution was the evolve, and in order to make that as simple as possible, we instead of using their area to mass distribution, mm -hmm. we just took, we said, okay, the most common one, the mode is 0.1 uh, meters squared per kilogram, and so let's do, do that as the only value. So yeah, it would be very interesting to, okay, now yeah, let's I, try to. I looked at a similar scenario from a geo breakup with a very limited number of samples, right. and, but with a distribution of area to mass ratios, I saw similar spiraling patterns, but then there were some other interesting features in there that 
right. raise, raise some questions. Right, so the whole size is a really in, an, an additional dimension. All right, Liam, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so for our next presentation, uh, we have Professor Terry Alfrand, uh, who's going to touch on a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is when does the uncertainty become non-Gaussian? Uh, thank you, Mariba. Uh, this is a problem that's uh, been bouncing around in my brain for several years. And uh, so I finally had to put something on paper and, and do something here. Uh, we all know that the, uh, and we heard from uh, Navar Singh from New America, some of the problems of, uh, earlier this morning about when the, the covariance <clears throat> is no longer realistic or, or the uncertainty is no longer Gaussian. The, um, this is, a, this is a big problem, and this is obviously a complex problem. But one of the things that I really like to do is to see if I can take these complex problems, reduce them, get, get a reduced model, and come up with results, <clears throat> obtain a functional relationship that gives you a tremendous amount of insight into the, into the complex problem, and then maybe this can be used to actually estimate something. Years ago, I was talking with uh, Boris Garfinkel, noted celestial mechanician, and he said, do you want an exact solution to an approximate problem, an approximate solution to an exact problem? And I think the answer to that question is that you want both, because they both give you something. And, but uh, I always like to try to get these simplified models and see what I can do. And I actually have a talk, a seminar that I've given a few times on this subject on a few problems that I've worked a lot uh, like that. And I, it's entitled, uh, Analysis versus simulation of brains versus computers. And uh, someday maybe I'll do that one. So that's what I want to talk about today, trying to come up with, because this is a complex problem to determine when this un uncertainty, uh, uh, when the uncertainty is no longer realistic and it impacts the decisions that we're making. So uh, this leads into, this is, uh, this is what my wife thinks I'm doing when I'm trying to work out these simple models. Now you can't read, probably cannot read that, but that's a picture taken uh, about one week after Sputnik was launched of uh, Sam Herrick, uh, uh, astrodynamics professor at, at UCLA. So that's what we do, folks. Uh, all right, so this is what I want to talk about today. First. What, what are the, how do we use covariance in space situational awareness? And most of these, those pro, these processes depend, assume that the, the, the uncertainty is Gaussian. So what's the impact when the covariance is in error? It may be the wrong size or else it's not Gaussian. And then I, I want to present the questions or objectives, the research questions I'm asking. And then these, these next three, the non-Gaussian metric, 6D, 2D, and 2D analysis are addressing those, those questions and then, and then summarize. So what are some of the uses uh, of the covariance? We heard earlier the, uh, uh, from uh, the folks in New America, the problem, some of the problems with the, the probability of collision and what happens there when, when uh, the, uh, the uncertainty uh, is no longer Gaussian. Uh, that's very critical because uh, we're making decisions of whether or not to maneuver satellites to avoid collisions, potential collisions. Uh, UCT processing is another use of covariance. Uh, I did a paper in 19, 1997 on using uh, the model Novus distance uh, for the, the association of uncorrelated tracks, and some of that work is now being implemented was, uh, by Chris Sable out here as part of the Geo Odyssey uh, program. But again, an assumption uh, that the covariance is Gaussian. Maneuver detection, Marcus Holzinger may be in here. He's done work along those lines. And then sensor tasking and the work's been done out here at, at PDS on uh, using the covariance for uh, tasking of the, of the optical sensors. Now, so let's look quickly at the impact of um, an error in the covariance. Now, what's plotted here, well, the top, there at the top is the equation uh, for probability of collision from the work done by Foster. And P is the covariance, uh, the P star is the covariance in the, what is it, the impact plane. But again, it's directly related, the, the, the probability of collision is directly a function of the covariance. And what's plotted here um, 
is that we took a notional example, and this is a very typical example, of uh, the calculate, took the probability of the collision, got a particular covariance, and then we just increased the size of the covariance in all axes uniformly. And so plotted on the x-axis is this factor k, so k equals one is the, the beginning example, k equals two is the covariance is twice as big. But what you see here is there's this particular region um, where if I'm going from one to two, you can see that there's a, a three to four order magnitude change in the probability of collision when the covariance is changing by a factor of two. And this is exactly in the region where you make the decision around 10 to the minus fourth or so on making a, a, a collision avoidance maneuver. So uh, this is just an error in the covariance in the size of it, but then if you add to this the fact that it may not be Gaussian, you, you, you can see the impact of uh, not having a realistic uncertainty. So, um, so these are my sort of research questions and, uh, or objectives. And the first is I, if I'm going to determine when the, metric, uh, the uncertainty is non-Gaussian, I have to have a metric that does that. And that's number one. And then I've sort of, uh, my simplified model then is to look at the 2D semi-major axis mean anomaly space to see if I can identify when the 6D uh, orbital element space becomes non-Gaussian. And I'll give you the answer to that. The answer to that is yes. We can do that. I'll we'll get to it in a minute. The third one is uh, put together an analytic method for determining when this uncertainty in the 2D uh, semi-major axis mean anomaly space becomes non-Gaussian. And the answer to that question is still unknown. I've got some approaches, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. So, um, as I said, this problem has been bouncing around my brain for several years. And it's this paper here by uh, the folks at New America and Matt Hayduck, Beyond Covariance Realism and New Metric for Uncertainty Realism. And when I was talking with them, uh, sort of the light bulb went off and I says, ah, that's the part, that's the one, that's the thing that I've been needing to, to solve this problem. Because uh, it, it get, there's a, in that paper, there's an analytic representation uh, using the, uh, the Kramer von Mises metric uh, that will uh, help answer the problem. So, this metric, it uses the Malinovis distance, which is dimensionless, and Malinovis distance is either, you can think of it as the number of standard deviations, so when you get a number for it, you have some idea what it means. Uh, and that's, it's also independent of the coordinate system. It uses all the state. It's not just a position determination. Uh, it's computationally tractable and statistically rigorous. And as I mentioned, it has both an analytic and a, and a numerical um, form of the PDF. You have to get that, but, uh, but, it's, it, but it uses it. And so I, this was an excellent paper, and I recommend it to you. Um, so that sort of set me on the path to trying to do, do a lot more on this problem. So here's the definition of the Malinobis distance. K is the, is the number of standard deviations. X is the state. And, and so basic is the error vector uh, transposed covariance times, uh, times the error vector. Uh, there is a form with it for it when the covariance or the uncertainty is, is, you, you, is not Gaussian. You have a PDF form. I'm not going to get into that uh, here, but there is such a form. Uh, and here's the metric. Which is, is this the laser? Yeah. All right, this is the, the, the Kramer von Mises metric. Uh, F star is the... Uh, cumulative distribution function of the, of the, of the Gaussian um, uh, Malinovis distance, and then F sub NK is the, is the um, uh, cumulative distribution function of, that you get from your, from your approximate or approximate model of the system. And for the 2D system, this is, this is F star, and so you stick that in there, and that's, what you, and that's what you have to evaluate. Now, there is also a form when it's just, when you have a number of samples from Monte Carlo, and, but I didn't put that up here, but we also used that. And then uh, here, one minus, oops, back. Here is uh, one minus alpha is the confidence. Uh, so, uh, and this is the, the range of the metric for which it, uh, well, these are the bounds on the metric for, uh, 
when the uncertainty is, is realistic or is, you can consider it Gaussian. I'll just be focusing on this one over here. So uh, if, if your omega squared is between 0 and 1.16, then you're 99% confident that, that the uncertainty is Gaussian. Well, I mean, we've done calculations with all of these, but the, uh, the results that I'll present are, are based on that. So I've already mentioned some of this. We know that the, uh, we assume, and then we have evidence, that the uncertainty is Gaussian at epoch. And, but then the non neglected nonlinearities in the uh, propagation of the covariance uh, cause, cause it to eventually become non-Gaussian. And the primary, and the primary um, nonlinearity that does that is the, it comes from the uncertainty in the semi-mage axis. It gives you the secular growth in the in-track direction. Uh, and we also know, and this uh, was brought up by uh, Singh earlier that this morning, uh, we know that the uncertainty remains Gaussian, the longest in orbital element space, and Cartesian is the worst. But there is a little problem that you have to compute the co uh, probability collision in Cartesian space. But still, uh, it does remain uh, Gaussian the longest in the orbital element space. So let's look at this 2D uh, mean anomaly semi-mage axis space. Here are the simple equations. It's equivalent to x double dot equals zero. Um, so I take that, and then I'm going to expand about the, um, so x hat is my estimated state. And I'm just going to, uh, and then n, n is the mean motion. So uh, this is my estimated state. I always work in dimensionless variables. So tau uh, uh, in, in t is, is, is my time variable. Uh, so I expand uh, about the estimated state, state. So delta L and delta A are the deviations from the estimated state. And so, and prime is the uh, derivative with respect to tau. So I get, get the A is constant, and oh, delta A is constant, and then there's this solution here. And it's this nonlinear, this is the first nonlinear term uh, that, ca that, causes our, that causes our problem. And so, uh, just quickly, this is the, uh, the solution here, state transition matrix, and this is the nonlinear term, and here's the Mahalanobis distance, and and this is my initial covariance. Uh, and, and rho is the correlation coefficient uh, with the two variables, delta A and delta L. And so I get a, a plot here, uh, an equation here for the Molinobis distance. Now keep in mind um, that we're dealing with a Hamiltonian system here. And so if, if the system is linear, and you can see it from here, uh, if the system's linear, then this term doesn't exist, and, and the Molinovus distance is constant along the trajectory. Now, you still get the volume uh, preservation of, of the propagation of uncertainty, but the Molinovus distance here, as you can see, is increasing in time when you include all, all the nonlinear effects. So uh, plotted here are some curves of constant uh, Molinovus distance, and, I, and it's plotted here for one. And I've made a change of variables uh, of y1 is delta a divi uh, divided by its standard deviation and y2. Th this is delta l0, not delta l, divided by its standard deviation. So we start out here with a circle with k equal 1. Uh, I set rho equal to 0 for this, for these, for this work, the, the correlation coefficient. And so you see here, uh, after one orbit, there's hardly any distortion. Uh, after 10 orbits, uh, and uh, in this one, the standard deviation of the semi-mage axis was 5 kilometers, and, and the semi-mage axis was 7,000 kilometers. So you can see here at 10 orbits, we've got a fair amount of distortion from the, from the initial circle. And as you'll see later in some of the results, uh, the uncertainty has already become non-Gaussian, and then you get more and more distortion as you, as you go out in time. Now this next, uh, the next chart, what, what this shows, uh, what we're trying to show here is uh, this is for 10 orbits and, and 40 orbits, but the, the blue line here, this is, this is k equal 1, uh, is, is at time 0, and then the other one is, at, uh, is, is for 10 orbits. And what we did here was we generated 10,000 samples uh, and, and then solved the exact solution and then plotted those with k, le k less than 1. So 
the, the curve is based on the approximate solution, including the first term in the, in the, in the Taylor series expansion, but the, all these plot points were with the exact solution. So it is saying that, that showing here that even up to 40 orbits, then that the, the first term in the expansion for, of, the, uh, of the mean motion in terms of delta A is sufficient to capture uh, the solution that, that we need. So, uh, so now let's look. We, we looked also at, uh, we selected the Kramer von Mises metric, but there's another one. There's several others, but one other we look, chose to, to, to look at is the Anderson Darling, and that's covered in the, in the paper by the numerical people. And it's just showing you here that we have, the, the, we're getting the same solution. We started out with the 7,000 kilometers. The semi major, uh, the intract error is one kilometer, so the mean anomaly is one over A. And so this is sigma A going up to 20 kilometers, and this is the time and orbits for which it beca uh, uncertainty becomes uh, non Gaussian. And, and we're getting th the same result from both, of the, both the metrics. We just wanted to make sure that what we were doing uh, matched the various metrics out there. Now, the, so the next one shows you. Uh, the effect of changing the, the initial intract standard deviation from one kilometer up to three kilometers, and you get this. It's, maybe it's, initially this was counterintuitive to me because it says that the larger your initial uh, uncertainty is, the longer it takes to become uh, non Gaussian. But I think what's going on here is the fact that, is that with the smaller um, an initial error in the intract direction, the covariance is narrow, so when you start getting distortion, it has more effect when, when, it, when, it's, when it's more narrow. I think that's the answer to that. So with this in uh, mind, we've got this portion. This, we've used, I don't have the close, a full closed form solutions here for using the, uh, the Kramer von Mises metric. It's, we're using the numerical form. So this is a result of, of 10,000 samples. So now, uh, the, the two-dimensional 60. So we, we took the same problem and um, used the equivalent standard deviations in six-dimensional. It's, it's all two-body. And so here shown is the time for the uncertainty to become non-Gaussian for, for the, the 2D in blue and the, six, the 6D in red and the 2D is in blue. And you can see that then that the, 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 using that semi-major axis, um, mean anomaly space gives you a, a very good approximation of when, of when the 6D system is going to become uncertain. And I, I thought this was start at the beginning, so that's one of the reasons I approached this. So we've answered, answered that part. Now, next, uh, so that's, that's the conclusion there. Um, so now to the, trying to get the 2D analytic formulation, I'm repeating some things here. Uh, this is, this is the metric. I showed this earlier. I'm, I make a transformation of variables here. And so K I've, is given here. And then I've, I've set rho equal to zero here. Now, how do I get? I, so what I need is this term here. I need the, the cumulative distribution function or probability density function for the Malanovis distance. And that transforms from, the, from this here. Uh, this is just the integral of I'm talking about time's up. The initial state here, it comes, and, it, and this is f of k for the Gaussian distribution. And I have to integrate this over the region d, which is defined by this constraint here. And uh, that's where I am. <laughs> I could spend another talk here explaining what has not worked. Uh, First thought is this, you know, this starts out, this term is zero. So I thought, oh, perturbation solution may work. But it turns out that this term here, when it becomes non-Gaussian, is, is not small. So that didn't work. So, and I, you try to match estimatic expansions, that didn't work. So that's the, where I am. So in summary, uh, we, can, we found that the, you can take this 2D system, develop a, a simplified model, and that gives you a good indication of when the 60 uncertainty becomes non-Gaussian. What I want here is a tool that I could give to somebody like Laura Newman, says, you've got, you've got a covariance. When is, that, when is that use of that covariance going to no longer be valid? 
in terms of it becoming non-Gaussian. That's what I, that my ultimate objective is to get a simplified tool here that people can use. Uh, the Kramer von Mises metric is, is very useful in this, uh, in this problem. And uh, it, it provides us a path for obtaining the analytical answer for the time when this uncertainty becomes non-Gaussian. And if any graduate students want a problem, you can work on this part, last part. It's, maybe you can get there before I do. Thank you. So would this be something that's useful in terms of like an Aegis or a Gaussian mixtures thing to determine when to split Gaussian components? Did that make sense? I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. So if you're doing like an Aegis Gaussian mixtures approach, uh, we need to decide when you're going to split a Gaussian PDF into several others. Um, do you think this would be a good approach or a way to check that? I'll let him answer that problem. <laughs> it, it might be. I don't know. I haven't looked at it in that regard. Okay. It, it could probably help, but I, they have other methods. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not real familiar with exactly how they, uh, the splitting, uh, Gaussian splitting decision making. Yeah. I know it has to do with eigenvectors, but. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, for our next presenter, uh, even though it says uh, Dr. Michael Bantel, we actually have the august and auspicious Doug Hendricks who's going to give us the next uh, talk, and it's going to be uh, very interesting, so thank you. Okay. All right, thanks, Mariba. Um, I'm going to talk about something that we call mites, and uh, it, it's uh, basically deviations from ballistic trajectories that we found in our data set um, from our global telescope network. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to do very long time, say 600 day long um, orbit fits on dead objects. And what we found was we weren't doing very well for just about any of them. And uh, so we decided that there was some impulsive momentum transfer events happening and imps didn't sound very good. So we decided to call them mites. It's kind of an awkward, kind of an awkward wording. Um, it also kind of makes sense because the kinds of delta Vs that we're seeing that are departures from a ballistic trajectory are on the order of about the size of a mite per second, like the ones that are in your skin. In the audience right now, there are mites. Uh, trust me. OK. Uh, OK. All right, so I've got an outline. Um, I'm probably going to run long, so I'm just going to try to hit the high points, because I, I didn't test this thing for time. We'll I'm sure you will. <laughs> OK. So um, this is the, the telescope network sites that we used. Uh, this is our global telescope network. In order to do this kind of uh, study, you, need to have, you do need to have a global telescope network. You need to have a large volume of data, and it needs to be pretty accurate data. This is a not-to-scale overlay of the observations that were used. It's about 600,000 observations of eight uh, graveyard objects, dead RSOs, and we don't really have 143 telescopes. Uh, you know, some of those died a long time ago, or they were taken out of service. But those were there were 143 unique telescopes used for the data in the study. Okay, what are they? I kind of told you, um, but this is kind of what a the residuals from an orbit fit look like for an object we were looking at, and if you look at Right here, we did a little 50-day orbit fit, and we found that, that is, if we propagated, after we did the fit, if we propagated that forward and looked at the residuals, there were just, it, it didn't, didn't flatten. Um, and that's, that's RA. Deck, deck just doesn't have as big errors. And there are just little kinks in it that we didn't understand. And we thought that's really strange, and we, we couldn't figure out what it was. And these, these were tiny little delta Vs we were seeing. So then we, we, we did it for a whole bunch of objects. And we thought it, it didn't work for any of them. So then we thought, did we, did we do something wrong? Uh, we really weren't sure uh, what we were seeing. So we went back and we looked at CARMHF. Um, either Mariba or Mike made a mistake, obviously. Um, or they both did. Maybe they both did. I don't know. But 
we did notice that they were more prevalent during eclipse season. And so that sort of told us we probably missed something. It's probably something not in our force model. So, and just, I realize at this point, I don't have any credibility uh, at this point in the, in the briefing. We'll get to the part where you see that, that the results actually make sense. But here's, the, here's what our orbit fits were looking, looking like here. So if I have, uh, if I do a data fit across this orange box here, and I try to do a single ballistic fit, I would get a V-shape sometimes. And that's basically two ballistic trajectories that meet at a point and, but don't fit our model. Um, so the question is, is our model wrong? Well, FARS is wrong, then CARMHF is wrong, because we did, we did check them together. And I'll show you some results from that. When it's a good data fit, like that little cyan region, you get a nice flat residual. This is plus or minus about 10 microradians. Uh, I think the units are 10, 20, 30, 40. Um, so when it's flat, you know that's a good fit, and your model fits. So the model we were using is basically like CARMHF, a cannonball model for solar radiation pressure. So that's pretty much the standard in the community. OK. So we asked ourselves, are these natural? Are they human-induced? I'll give this side of the room a little love here. OK. Um, we didn't know. We had no idea, so we just started writing stuff down. What if there are debris collisions? What if there's outgassing during the you know, thermal stress on a satellite and things crack in the, in the vent? Uh, we really didn't know. Um, we talked to a lot of satellite operators. And they were, they were kind of thinking, hey, we might have, you know, we might have things crack and stuff vents out. Um, none of these things we, we could actually check. So if you, if you lose your keys in a dark room, you go over to the room that has light on because that's the only place you can see your keys. So we decided to look in the room where we could actually do something, which is check if we're modeling the forces correctly. Um, right here was just something I threw in to show that we did a comparison with CARMHF. And at the residual, the statistics of the residuals at that level, we did agree on the fit for a certain, for a certain uh, uh, object that we did um, on an AFRL SBIR. OK, so then we had to come up with some hypotheses. And before I go on, I just realized I forgot to give proper credit where credit's due. All of the hard work was done by Dr. Mike Bentel, um, who's not here as William Therian, who is really the one that put all the technology together that, where we built our telescope network and, and do this processing. And back there with the curly hair is Mark Jeffries, Jr. We call him MJ. And he is the one who built the entire network. He's never home. He travels the world about 80% of the year. So if you want to talk to someone who's fielded 125 telescopes around the world, talk to MJ. So uh, Mike just, just started canvassing all the literature you could find, and, and he found the Yarkovsky effect. The Yarkovsky effect is if I have a, just take the sun illuminating an object and the object is tumbling, that object will get heated on the side that's facing the sun, but the rotation of the object will make the hot spot be a little bit off radial from the direction to the sun. And what that does is it creates a force on the object as the photons are escaping in this direction due to radiation. OK, so we don't actually have a way of testing whether we are measuring, um, have a measurable Yarkovsky effect. Just want to make sure that's clear. Also, we've always been intrigued by the idea that we know that spacecraft have anisotropic reflections. They're not, they're not perfect spheres. The question is, is that measurable? And so, for example, this object here um, is going to preferentially go in that direction because most of the light is going to go off to the right. So in general, we wanted to come up with a model that could at least account for the following, which would be if there is a component to the forces that stem from the solar radiation pressure that is not directed radially away from the sun. And that's all we did. So it would account for some goofy looking thing like this. But the model is actually pretty simple. So let's look at that model. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about sensitivities. Um, so there's two things that really we think are, are the things that make the difference. One, we have asymmetric forces on an object that are due to the solar radiation pressure in some form. Secondly is whether you are turning off that force at the proper time. And if I turn off 
If I turn, fail to turn off the, just the solar a cannonball model in the back of the sun, I'm, I'm not accounting for a cross-track force that would perturb the orbit. And that, that is not a very big effect because the, the velocities would add in quadrature and it wouldn't be a big change in the energy. But if I don't account for a force for an object that goes behind the sun and it is in track, it's a big effect because the energies add linearly. Okay, so what we're looking for is any uh, solar radiation pressure force components that we didn't model correctly that are in track. And in this case, where symmetry is broken because we forgot to turn off the sun properly. And that's something that is not in any models that I know. And I know that seems a little convoluted, so if you want to talk afterwards, um, I'd be happy to, and I'm sure Mike would as well. So we came up with an uh, idea that, okay, every, everyone knows how to turn off solar radiation pressure back there, but we did the same thing, but we did not have the, the non-radial or the, the force that was perpendicular to the uh, orbit, which is in track, we didn't even have one. Um, so that was sort of one of our clues when we started looking at the data. Um, we did not at all have solar eclipses that are due to the moon in our force model. And I don't know if, if anybody else does in the room. If you do, uh, talk to me afterwards. But I, did, I didn't find any papers where anybody did. So we had to put the moon in our model as well. So uh, let's talk about how we upgraded our SRP model. Here's your, your standard cannonball model. It's a sphere. There's a force directed radially away from the sun. And if I just come up with a model that's a sphere that can have a slightly off radial uh, component, this is the model here. It's got two components. And then the model we decided to use is sort of a generic diffuse ellipsoid model. And it has, it's a three component fit, and it, it just accounts for the fact that I can have, I have standard cannonball solar radiation pressure. I have a slightly off radial angle and magnitude of this other component that wasn't modeled before. And you can look at all the, this is all correct, and that's kind of a little conceptual uh, model of the thing. OK, so we did this upgrade. So how did it go? All right, so I'll remind you of what we had before. We had something like that. And so far, everything I've said to you um, I wouldn't be surprised if you look at me and say, I don't, I don't tune me out, whatever. I, I don't know what this guy's talking about. I don't believe anything he's saying. Now, this is important to realize. We have now properly modeled an effect that only occurs when the sun is eclipsed by the Earth or the sun is eclipsed by the moon. Okay, that's the only time when we, that's the only place where we've, ever, we've changed our model. And that's what happened. So for starters, it doesn't actually, you don't think it looks that good. Well, two of the objects actually still don't fit the model. Everybody else is along that line. So I'm going to take, remove those two objects. And for the six objects that fit well, that's the residuals for an orbit fit using nine parameters over 600 days, meaning that over that time, our measurements all lie within plus or minus a kilometer. And it's, it's completely flat, except for there is this seasonal variation. We didn't model out of, any out-of-plane forces because we didn't really feel we had any measurables to estimate them. OK, so we were happy. Um, but there were still, still two objects that we didn't quite understand, so we're still missing something. So this particular object, after the upgrade, so it didn't quite look very good there. So this is 38101. Post upgrade, we were able to sort of flatten this part, but not quite. But we still had these two kind of kinks in the, in the orbit. Uh, we still don't understand those. Uh, so we started looking at the photometry. Actually, why we became interested in this was because uh, it did have a photometric change um, in our database. So in our database, it's really easy to go in and look at you know, two years or three years of photometry for an object, and it's a lot of data. Here's, here's about a year of data for that object. And so you see for quite a long time, it was, there was sort of an envelope here, and then that envelope changed. And I'm going to go ba back, I think these are the red button here. Right where this half a millimeter per second kink occurred in the residuals, 
um, I call it on the left of it region one and to the right of it region two. And it coincided with this time where the, the, there was a change in the photometric behavior of the object. So what this means is that in order to accurately perform orbit estimation for an object, and if you want to do it as precise as we're doing it, you have to have a signature model, a reflective signature model for your object in order to get all the forces right. And that's what, you, that's what we learned from this. Still don't know about the other kink, but we very clearly saw something here. So it doesn't mean we know what's going on, but we know it's important to model reflections and the directionality of the reflections. So looking at nights of photometry pre and post uh, kink, so in region one, uh, we can very see, you know, these are nights of data, so what you're seeing is a tumbling, a tumbling object, and it's tumbling on the order of a period of about a minute, I would say. It gets brighter at midnight, and it's dimmer beginning and the end of the night. After that kink, and this is the same time scale, these are whole night collections, and it's very clear that something has changed. So that would tell me that it could be the plane of rotation or something has changed, so now light is reflecting differently, and we were able to pick that up in the orbit fit. Okay, so I'll just very briefly touch on path forward, because uh, I'm pretty sure there might be questions. Um, so path forward is we're, we're trying to understand if we can build an understanding of the reflected model for an RSO just based on the data that we've collected. We don't really have a lot of out-of-plane data, so we don't, we don't have telescopes that are at very large um, latitudes, and, and even higher would be better because you can see the top of the spacecraft, so we're stuck to, stuck to the Earth. So build up models. Um, we'll come, come up with a signature model, and that would be you know, astrometric, photometric data fusion applied to um, orbit fit. Um, Here's just an example of our first rudimentary attempt to come up with a model for Galaxy 15. So you're looking at about one and a half million observations of Galaxy 15 uh, from a whole bunch of telescopes. And what we do is we take a diffuse sphere model and we take a plate model. There are several plate models. And we just, by hand, kind of try to mimic the features that we see in the data. And what you're looking at here, uh, simulation versus data, and if I divide them, I kind of flatten it out, um, come up with a, so you can kind of see they look very similar. And I'm not sure if there's another plot. There isn't another plot. So that's kind of the, where we are now. We're just playing with that right now. I wouldn't say it's ready for prime time. Probably should even have shown it here. So we'll move on. Um, all right, in summary, very simple. Um, we were able to use a single nine state uh, fit and we're able to understand the position. All of our measurements for the object lay within about one kilometer of one another. We thought that was pretty amazing. There were some objects that didn't fit. What we're thinking is we really need, really need to be able to model satellite signatures in order to, to move this uh, research forward. Thank you very much. Good job, Doug. Before both questions, I just want to put it out there that CARMHF does model all these things. So I just want to. I was <laughs> just going to comment on that. It's embedded in there. It may be turned off, but there there are several um, eclipse options that you have. One of them is is a physics based um, formulated by a guy named Bokrelicki, which counts for the Yarkovsky and the atmospheric refraction effects. Uh, there's also um, an attitude-dependent SRP model and a thermal emissions. And actually, Mar Mariba and I wrote a paper on your sensitivity to those things in, in a Amos uh, conference a few years ago. So, but thank um, you. They may be turned off when we parallelized CARM HF. It's a computationally uh, expensive function to model all that that stuff. So. Uh, that's probably why we turned it off. We didn't realize someone would actually notice. That's pretty cool. It's, it's just, just, just a sign of the quality of your data, I guess. It's Thanks, Tom. Able to see that. that wasn't a question, though. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I have less of a question and more of a statement also. First, I, I always appreciate it when someone highlights the fact that we have this cannonball model. It's more of a pleasant fiction than it is uh, really anything else. 
Uh, but the, the other point I'd just like to maybe direct you towards is that there's a lot of great work by McMahon and Shears uh, that, that address exactly this point, uh, combined, you know, solar radiation pressure and uh, uh, near Koski effects, um, you know, particularly applied to long-term orbit average equations of motion. Uh, and I, I just think that that would be interesting to you guys, and you should think about looking at those. Okay. Thanks. So far, no questions. Okay. I know. They're just telling me something. Uh, just a quick comment. The, um, about 2000, in one of the U.S.-Russian workshops, they presented a paper. They presented a paper uh, which they claimed it was, they were seeing something similar that they thought were small collisions at GEO. And that's about all I remember after 15 years or so. But if I can get back into my files and think if I can find that, I'll send it to you. Because they never really concluded anything. They were just showing us what they were seeing. So yeah, yeah, we were actually hoping that it turned out to be collisions and then uh, it might be evidence for, you know, small micro collisions at geo, micrometeorites. Um, so I definitely would love to uh, hear, hear kind of what you've, what you've done. All right. Sorry, we don't have time for any more questions. Well, there weren't any. Yeah, well. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Doug. Our next paper comes to us from Lawrence Livermore National Lab on the subject of uh, essentially combining optical imaging data for S, uh, SSA purposes. The presentation will be by William Dawson uh, in place of uh, Michael Snyder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, pass along Michael's apologies. He was very much looking forward to coming to this Amos conference, and I can. Uh, tell him how much he's missed because uh, this has been very exciting. And related to that, Michael developed these slides. He uh, made these slides. And he has a very different uh, slide design style than I normally do. Um, and I was planning on remaking the slides, but the conference has been so interesting that I haven't uh, wanted to spare any of my free time to do that. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, though, is synthesis of disparate optical uh, imaging data. And we've heard a great deal about this throughout the conference, uh, about the need to take data from multiple telescopes, multiple sources, and combine that. Um, in fact, uh, from, from the very beginning of day one, uh, Major General Thompson said that this is going to be a big new push um, of uh, the 18th space. And we heard that echoed later on in the day uh, by Lieutenant Colonel um, Putnam, Scott Putnam. And also, this has also been a continuing theme as our uh, EU uh, friends has also talked about the need of taking data from, from Poland, uh, Great Britain, and other countries and, and combining that into a, into a coherent source because we should really be working together uh, to make the best possible SSA characterization we can. Now, uh, this is a hard problem to do uh, poorly, and it's an even harder problem to do a good job at. Now, what I'm going to focus on today is optical imaging data, but what I'm going to outline uh, is generally applicable, and it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to combining optical data from uh, two multiple optical sources, but it could be optical plus radio data. All right. So the basic problem is, is uh, consider you've got a single object in orbit. So you've got that target over there, for example. It's orbiting around Earth, and it's been observed by two or more uh, instruments at uh, significantly different spatial locations. It could also be different temporal locations as well. Uh, and then the big question is, is how do we combine the ob observations from these two or more telescopes uh, to yield the optimal orbital inference that's even better than uh, combining uh, that data and, and quadrature sum of the individual observations? And so what I'm going to outline today and use as an example is this particular scenario where you've got an object, let's say it's in GEO. So we simulated an object in GEO. Uh, we then said, all right, we've got two other space-based telescopes in sub-GEO uh, orbits. Um, and we've also got a ground-based telescope. And then I'm going to run you through the general process of how we combine this data. 
All right, so very central to this method is actually forward modeling the streak images. And so we found it very important uh, to go back to the image data. And as long as you're working with the image level data, uh, then you can do great things. And so forward modeling is that you, you have some uh, image and, and you have a streak in it, for example, and you want to model that. Uh, whoops, there we go. So you've got, uh, you need to create a streak model, and this generally has six parameters uh, for uh, a model of a streak in an image. You've got the position, x and y, uh, length, flux. You've got the position angle and the point spread function width. Now, there are additional parameters that you can model. You can uh, model the noise. Uh, in the most basic scenario, you just model the noise on the streak image, and this gives you your data model. In this data model, you'll then compare with your actual data. Uh, and I've got a poster up going into more details about the, uh, the likelihood function of this, but, but basically you want to simulate your data to compare it with your, um, to compare, simulate the data, compare it with your real data, and then that gives you a likelihood function, and you can do parameter estimates. Now, you can additionally incorporate into your model, uh, let's say you don't exactly know where your telescopes are pointing, uh, so you can, you can add those in. And so with noise and the pointing uncertainty, that's three additional parameters. You could also marginalize or model the telescope position. Let's say that you've got some uncertainty in your satellite positions. You can model that as well. And so this is an example of a simulated image uh, that we're going to be analyzing here, and this is just one of the three images. Uh, but when you're dealing, and I'm not sure if you can see it, uh, there's a streak right there. If I skip ahead, I've, I've now circled the streak, but this is a very low signal-to-noise uh, streak. The surface brightness of the streak is much lower than the RMS noise. And whenever you're dealing with this, it's very important to do so in a probabilistic model. You can't do single point estimates like are canonically done. And so whenever we, we do our forward model approach, uh, we end up doing an MCMC analysis, and you end up with a posterior probability distribution function or density function uh, here from the MCMC analysis. And here's a triangle um, covariance plot where you have your streak positions. So you've got x in this column. You've got y in that column. Uh, you also have the uh, radial position angle uh, of your streak, the flux of your streak, the length of your streak, and the uh, point spread function full width half max. And so this has about uh, 10,000 uh, samples in it, so 10,000 points in it. Uh, and what you can see in the gray crosshairs is that's the truth of our simulated streak. And this is just for one of the telescopes here. But you can see that. Uh, we actually characterize that very low signal-to-noise uh, quite well. It all resides within the uncertainty distributions. And importantly, you actually see that for some of the parameters, there's very strong covariance uh, between them. And so again, you don't want to do some naive uh, um, assumption about, about your uncertainties in these various models. This way enables you to account for all of your uncertainty and your covariance properly. All right. But that's just modeling the parameters of the streak. We, re we really want to model the orbit of this streak. And so how do you go from these random samples of the image properties of the streak to actual orbital parameters? And so you, you start off. Now, in that image, we had RA index start, start and end points of our streak. Um, but we didn't have the range constrained at all. This was a, a first time observation, let's say. And so we had no constraint on the range. So if we want to take those, um, those MCMC samples from our streak model and convert them into an orbital model, one of the things that we have to sample is the ranges of the start and end of the streak. And so for this, we use a highly correlated uh, Gaussian prior. And, and this is the uh, range of the start of the streak and the range of the end of the streak. And you can see that it's highly correlated. And actually, this really just happens naturally. Even though it looks like everything's on a, a line, there's just some width to it. It's just that there's much more uncertainty in the actual range. But you can imagine, since we require that the orbit be bound uh, in this particular case, that you have a high correlation. You wouldn't expect a very Oops. You wouldn't expect a very large range for one end of the streak and, and, not, and a very close range for the other, because then you'd end up with a parabolic orbit, and it would be unbound. All right, so, so we sample from that. Uh, 
for the orbit, we can actually discard the streak flux and the point spread function parameters. We marginalize over those. Uh, we then combine the ranges uh, and the streak angular positions to get samples of the 3D position vectors uh, at the start and the end of the streaks. Okay? And now, once we have the three-dimensional uh, uh, coordinates of the start and the end of the streaks, we can actually transform this easily into oscillating Keplerian orbital elements. And so here you just have, uh, we won't go into the details right now, but you've got your six orbital elements for this. Now the nice thing about this is because we are, one at a time, you're transforming individual samples. You don't have to worry about any of the inaccuracies of, of say, transforming Gaussians from one coordinate system into a highly nonlinear coordinate system. So this avoids a lot of the problems which other people have been trying to solve. And we heard a number of talks about those. And it does so in, a, in an accurate and uh, lossless manner. All right. Now, I love this plot, OK? This is one of my favorite plots here. So what is shown over here is now your uh, posterior probability density function, but for your six orbital parameters, and then color-coded by whether or not it came from the ground-based telescope, uh, or blue for one of the space-based telescopes, and green for the other space-based telescope. Now, you can tell that the uncertainty distribution in this, in each one of these parameters, is highly uh, non-Gaussian, highly non-linear. Uh, but it's all been captured accurately by our forward model approach. Uh, what you can also see is, um, is that while individually any one of the parameter estimates from one telescope uh, of this uh, one epoch of streak imaging is very uncertain, they actually cross in very few locations. And what's shown in the uh, black crosshairs in each of the panels is the actual truth value for the simulated orbit. And so you can see that all of these wildly uncertain uh, distributions actually cross in the uh, overlapping in the truth area. OK. So how then do we go from this to an actual orbit uh, estimate? Because we still have these three uh, separate uncertainty distributions uh, here from these three separate telescopes, but we need to, to define one orbit. And how we do this is multiple important sampling. And again, this is statistically rigorous, and it's the most efficient way and as far as uh, conservation of information goes. But what you do is you take each of your samples from, from one of these uh, telescopes and you evaluate it in the likelihood function of the other two telescopes. And so what this does is that for each of these samples, you get an associated weight of, essentially, it's a consistency weight. And you say, do these, do these agree? And then that enables you to get out uh, a meaningful posterior. You can do um, important sampling uh, on these points. And so you get out a meaningful uh, distribution of points uh, for, the, for the combined orbit. Now, this also has a number of advantages. Um, and, and one such advantage is that, let's say you made a mistake and you thought that one of your telescopes was actually observing the same streak, but it really wasn't observing the same streak as your other two. You could imagine crowded fields, this could happen. What will happen in that case is then for that telescope, its distributions will be inconsistent with the distributions of the others, and its points will receive very low likelihoods, and so they won't contribute to the final posterior parameter distribution. This same multiple important sampling method can also be used um, for uh, probability of collision. Right? Because there, you, you can apply the same thing. It's different, but you have two uncertainty distributions of where objects will be at some future point. You can then do the multiple important sampling, where you take samples from one, evaluate it in the likelihood of the other, and vice versa. And then you can actually calculate a rigorous probability of collision. Uh, we, we didn't explore that here in this short talk, but I'd be happy to talk to you more about it afterwards. All right. So, here is, um, here's a comparison study. And in this, this is the marginal uh, posterior parameter distributions for your six orbital elements. Um, 
And red shows you what you get if you're just using the ground-based telescope and you take three consecutive 30-second exposures and how well you can co constrain the orbital parameters from that. Blue shows what you get from one ground-based telescope with 10 consecutive 30-second exposures. And then what's shown here in green is what you get from the three telescopes observing, the, observing just one streak. So, so no, um, no sampling in time. It's the same, same time, but just that. And so you can see that if you want to get the same information from a ground-based telescope uh, as you do from these, this, uh, this toy model where you have a ground-based telescope and two space-based telescopes, you actually have to observe it for considerably longer amounts of time. That's OK sometimes, but sometimes these objects are moving so fast, you don't sample them as often, and maybe you only get one or two snapshots of the object. Now, this is just summarizing uh, kind of that here with showing that, OK, this is what you get with one ground telescope, increasing the number of subsequent exposures and going up to 10 uh, consecutive exposures, and showing the ground level um, for one of our orbital parameters here. And uh, this is one ground plus two uh, space telescopes, one exposure, 30 seconds each. Uh, and then this is showing you the standard deviation of the mean longitude in degrees. So this is the degrees along the orbital path. And so you can see that with the ground-based telescope, if you only have one shot at this, uh, you've got basically 40 degrees of uncertainty in where that is in the path. And so if you want to come back and follow that up, good luck doing that. However, if you've only got one or a few shots, you can uh, do a much better characterization and constraint uh, by combining information from multiple telescopes. All right, so in summary here, uh, we're using a hierarchical probabilistic model for optical streak images. Uh, and this is to perform orbital inferences, but it has broader implications than that. This enables us to use arbitrarily low signal to noise uh, ratios and arbitrary numbers that works on uh, arbitrary numbers of exposures. You can have one, you can have thousands. It doesn't matter. It works. Uh, you can also combine information from arbitrary telescopes, ground, space, uh, optical, radio. Uh, it doesn't matter. And it's all done in a statistically rigorous fashion. Not only that, but it also enables compression of your image information because, let's say you've got a low bandwidth on your satellites, you don't need to transfer down the entire image. You can transfer down uh, a few of your MCMC samples of your streak, and that's all you need. And then it's a lossless um, process. You can go through and you can do a rigorous orbit determination um, at a later point on ground, or you can uh, worry about combining all of the information at some later time. All right. And clearly, there are distinct advantages uh, to observing something in orbit uh, with very long baselines. And that can be from space, uh, you have added information, and from ground. And just finally, uh, the statistical separation of image and orbit analysis is general, uh, it's flexible, and it's computationally advantageous. So thank you. Very good. We have time for a couple of questions, if they're easy. Yeah, so um, I guess uh, my question is, I, I got a little bit lost with how you determine whether you're looking at the same object or not. Ah, OK. So if we go back here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, all right, here we go. So what you would expect in this case, so let's say that one of your telescopes was looking at a different object. All right. Now, the reason everything works out here is not just because, say, red, blue, and green overlap in any one of these parameter spaces. It works because red, blue, and green overlap in all, all six of my orbital parameters. Now, so what would happen Let's say if you were looking at a different object uh, from one of these other telescopes, or the telescope was looking at a different object, then it would come up 
with a different distribution of, uh, it, say, the blue points. The blue points would maybe intersect the red and green points at different locations. And while it might intersect the red and green uh, uh, samples, it's very unlikely that it would overlap them in all six uh, parameter spaces. Yes. And so what happens, and we've tested this, what happens is whenever you do the multiple important sampling and you're evaluating each of the blue uh, parameter samples and the likelihood functions of the other two telescopes, those get heavily downweighted. And you say, I, it actually, the method says, um, I assign very low likelihood to each of my blue samples because my other samples are consistent. And so then it naturally gets downweighted. And you can combine that and say that I have very low confidence in, in, in the data from this particular telescope. I mean, so you say you validated, is that with real data? No, that's with another sample. So we said, OK, less feed. Um, because in this, you know, you know that you're feeding one telescope a wrong streak or something wrong. And so we know that it's wrong. And then we tested it that way. Well, I guess but we're I'm in the process of applying this to real data. OK, because I mean, I'm just saying real data, noisy, corrupt with biases, that sort of stuff. And the, the data association piece, I don't think it's going to be as trivial as you think it will be. Oh, no, it's still not, uh, it's still not trivial. But uh, this will do a better method than, than most others. And okay. we'll statistically, talk, we'll talk more. sure. Let's thank our speaker again. OK, um, today I'm going to be talking about moving towards relaxing the spherical assumption. So I think it's commonly known that the spherical, well, the solar radiation pressure model has been used ubiquitously for orbit determination and propagation of objects in uh, MEO and GEO orbits. And I mean, it's going to work, it works reasonably well. The object is spherical, of course, as you would expect. But in some cases, it, it might even work if, or for non-spherical objects if it's spinning fast and tumbling randomly. But this brings on a couple of questions. First of all, how fast is fast? And how important is the orientation, the initial orientation? So here, I'd like to sort of try and you know, shed some, it, some insight into answering those questions. But you might be thinking, well, if we're concerned about accuracy, why even bother? Like, trying to know, like trying to work with the spherical assumption, just why don't we just assume everything's non-spherical? Fine. I mean, that would lead to, or potentially lead to more, um, <clears throat> sorry, more accurate orbit predictions. But it can also bring on some unwanted effects, like if we're doing an all, all conjunction assessment, it will hinder the computation performance, and also, it might even make a catalog more complicated than it really needs to be. So having some insight into whether we can use a spherical assumption or whether we should consider a higher fidelity approach would be beneficial, or at least we, we believe it would be beneficial to the SR, sorry, the, um, is the uh, yeah, at least beneficial to the um, SSA community. All right, so. So when we do all the predictions, I mean, there are several applications um, which I've listed there. And what's important is that each case will have its own sort of level of accuracy associated with it. So why that's important is because for this particular analysis, I need to know what the threshold is where I decide to use one approach or the other. So say if I was to do a, if I was collecting data for a conjunction analysis, then I might use the proximity threshold to set my limit. So if I was to take or look at the separation from using the SRP, um, the spherical SRP model, and compare that to a high fidelity approach, which accounts for the orientation and spin rate of, of, the, um, of the plate, which I, sorry, I forgot to mention that I'm going to be focusing on a, a flat plate in, in a geo orbit. And if I look at the separation, I want to be able to see what happens when the um, spin rate decreases. Oh, yeah, when, I, when I decrease the spin rate, I want to see what happens when I go, 
what happens to the separation so I can decide which, way, which approach to choose. Okay, so now here are some of the assumptions that I've used for this analysis. Um, I've highlighted the, perhaps the most important ones there in, in red, um, like the initial epoch is that the vernal equinox um, going to be considering uh, lunar and non-spherical Earth gravity. We're taking the order to be 10. And so I'm also going to be looking at uh, yeah, um, non-zero non specular and diffuse reflections as well. All right, so here's how I've defined the orientation. So you can see if I want to calculate the effective area, um, I can use that equation there on the top. And the normal to that in the inertial system can be found by a series of rotations and that can, can be um, linked to the normal in the body fixed frame. So for example, if I set my initial orientation to be zero, the body fixed frame will be con coincide with the inertial system. And then as I sort of rotate around the x axes, the y axes, and then the z-axis, you can see how it changes, basically. I mean, this is pretty standard stuff if you've worked with um, attitude dynamics. Um, so that, as I said before, the two models, I'll, I'm going to be considering the spherical assumption, of course. And I'm sure most of you have seen that before. And you know, a Lambertian BR, BRDF model, which counts for the specular and diffuse reflections. So this is applicable to a plate, this particular model. And, of course, the more facets you add, it, it, it's going to get more complicated. All right, so because I'm going to be comparing the two cases, I need to be able to estimate the, the um, so-called gamma value for the spherical case, which is basically the, the product of CR with the error to mass ratio. And in order to do that, I need to consider the fact that the normal can, in general, be in a component in the direction of the sun or also in a perpendicular component. So if I take that in consideration, I can rewrite the BRDF model like this. And because I know the SRP model is oblivious to any, any um, forces in, or that aren't in the direction of the sun, I can ignore that second term, take that first term, take the average of it, and then come up with an expression like this, which I can then use to estimate this, the, the gamma value. All right, so using that, I can then calculate the separations. All right, and what you see there is the projected separation in the radial, long track, and cross track directions. And basically, the, the behavior is it's periodic, as you can see, with a growing amplitude. And that, the period to that, those um, curves are actually consistent with the orbital period. And the the most dominant case is in the long track direction, which you would perhaps would, which you would expect. And perhaps what's important there is the actual amplitude, which is about 40 meters, which in practical terms, I mean, 40 meters is, is, is quite good. I think most people will be happy with their, their predictions within 40 meters of the actual object. Now, as I rotate it around, you can see um, that it's qualitatively similar. So I'm getting roughly the same order of magnitude there and then Again, it's very similar, so not really seeing that much changes when I rotate around the z-axis. But when I rotate around the y-axis, I can see that it's considerably, considerably different. I'm getting these beats, which are clearly shown there. And then there's also this strong secular drift in the long track direction. And the maximum magnitude now in this particular case is about um, 300 meters, which is almost an order of magnitude bigger than what we saw previously. But it's still within about one kilometer of the um, yeah of of the object, basically. Now, if I rotate around the x-axis, you can see now I'm getting roughly the same behavior as what I had previously when I rotate around the z-axis. But the order of magnitude is now around 300 meters, and then if I rotate around the full 90 degrees, it's over one kilometer there. So. I mean, the reason why we would expect it to be, have a larger magnitude in this particular case is perhaps because, sorry, for this particular orientation that 
you, you will end up with resultant forces due to speckle and diffuse reflections, which are occurring in directions which are, um, well, you can see, laid out by that plane there. So that they, so as, as the plate spins around, basically they're, getting just, they're just getting averaged out. And if they're also acting in the, the perpendicular to, to the sun direction, then they won't be able to be captured by the spherical assumption. So you probably would expect to have a larger separation for this particular orientation. Now, all the results you've seen here now are basically for the fastest spin rate that I've considered in this analysis. So what I want to do now is slow down the spin rate and see what happens. But before I look at the separation, I'm going to consider the semi-major axis because I know that the semi-major axis is affected by um, accelerations in the along track and the uh, radial direction, and also because it allows us to see when the coupling between the orbital period and the spin period starts to creep in. Okay. So what you see there on the left-hand side is the semi-major axes for the plate, the full, the full plate model. And I've subtracted out the semi-major axes for the case where there's no SRP, so I'm only considering lunar and um, non-spherical Earth gravity effects. And you, you see it's basically just a sinusoidal sort of curve. And if you were to do the analysis just using a perturbed two-body problem, you'd pretty much get the same result. Now, you see on the bottom there, there's a fit to that curve, and that frequency is um, consistent with the orbital frequency, that's 6.4. And it's also what we see in the FFT analysis, where you can see that large peak is at a value um, very close to 6.4 there. And so as I slow it down, um, we can see that we, almost, we, don't, we don't get much, uh, we don't see any significant difference in the results there when, when the spin rate's at around half an hour. But then when I get to about six hours, I can see I have the characteristic behavior I saw previously, but there's some extra, something um, else happening here. There are some extra additional effects. And if you've noticed on the right-hand side in that, in, that F, in that fast Fourier transform analysis, you see some extra peaks which have appeared there. So to try and capture those effects, what we can do is we can propose a cosine series expansion where the frequency to those, um, for those terms will be a linear combination of the orbital frequency and a positive or negative multiple of the spin frequency. So we use that, so that sorry, that, that's, that's what you sort of use for the expansion there. And then if I fit the data again, I can see that the most dominant cases are actually consistent with those peaks you saw in the FFT analysis. And if I slow it down even further, as you can see now, the semi-major axis is completely different to the spherical case. Um, and you can see again that the dominant terms are consistent with the FFT analysis there. So you're getting a, a spin frequency of uh, 0.93 and 1.8 radians per day. All right. So now what I could do is I can take the amplitudes for each case and then plot that as a function of the spin period. And what you see there is um, on the top there in the green is the spherical case that one, the, the, the one in the purple there is the DC offset. You can see that doesn't really change that much until you get to about six hours. And also the other cases are the two dominant um, next um, dominant terms in the, of, in the amplitudes. And they are um, basically small to begin with. And then they increase pretty much linearly until you get to about six hours. And then you can start to see a, a, an increase in the trend for the blue case and then a decrease in the, the slope for the the red case there. And that's consistent with where we start to see the, the, um, those coupling effects creep in, in those previous slides. Now on the right hand side there, what I've taken is the maximum separation. So what I mean by maximum, so over a 10 day prediction span, just taken the maximum value and then I'm plotted those as a function of the spin period. And so you can see initially, if you look at the data, there's not really that much change. But then as we start to slow down the spin period, you see after about, well, when the spin period is about 6.7 hours, we're getting a separation of about 1K, and then it just grows rapidly from that point onwards. Just take note that, that these are actually log, log scales as well, so it, um, it actually increases much quicker than uh, what you see there. All right, so if I change the orientation, 
Now what I see on the right hand side is the um, separation or the spin period um, where the separation breaks the 1k mark is only about 1.9 hours in this case, so it's almost three, uh, almost a third of what we saw previously. And so what, why we probably would expect this to occur is because for this particular orientation, um, we're going to have resultant forces which are acting in the radial along track direction, which initially just get averaged out as the plate spins fast, but as we slow down the spin period, those terms have a little bit longer to act on the object, so it's not surprising that we're seeing a larger separation for this particular case at an earlier time. Now rotated by the full 90 degrees around the, the Z axis and basically yeah, we, saw, we see similar results to what we saw previously. Now if I rotate around the, the Y axis by 45 degrees, you've probably noticed that the amplitudes um, dropped uniformly, or the values for the amplitudes dropped uniformly and the, um, the time is now about 9.3 hours where the separation breaks that 1K mark. And then if I rotate around the 45 degree, um, by 45 degrees around the, the x-axis, you can see that basically um, what's happened is the, the value of the separation gets larger but remains constant for longer as we increase the spin period, basically. All right, so what, what we're basically trying to show here was that, you know, hopefully we, we've gained some insight into whether we should choose a spherical case, whether that is um, sufficient for, you know, for our purposes, or whether we can start to consider a higher fidelity approach. Okay, and, I'll, and basically the we saw that once the coupling kicked in, um, that the separation grew rapidly, but in the linear regime, we saw um, these, the, the orientation had a significant impact on the, uh, on the separation, basically. And, uh, but when the, when the coupling effects were strong, the orientation was basically, of the separation wasn't really that dependent on the orientation, or at least not as much as when, when the spin rate was a lot faster. And yeah, I think that's pretty much conclusive. All right, aside from the weird strobe light going off in the room, anybody have any questions? I have a question. Um, so your gamma parameter is the uh, reflection times, uh, the coefficient times area divided by mass, and you average that for uh, sufficiently long to get sort of the effective area, right? No, I average it over one, one spin period. Okay, so over one spin period. Yeah. But you sort of get the average um, projected area. So do you, do you offhand know, and it looked like it was like about a not 0.18? Yeah. A lot of your things. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember what the mass and the coefficient were? So I, what I'm trying to think about is, if you have a plate and it's spinning, what's its effective area? So is its effective area, you know, like let's say it's one square meter, yeah. but then it's tumbling about random axes, is it effectively um, 0.1 square meters? Is it effectively 0.2 square meters? Like is it effectively 0 0.02? Do you, do you know those numbers? Like do you know the mass and the coefficient? Yeah, I set the, in the analysis, I just set those values. But it doesn't really, I mean, the, it's more about the gamma value, really. Um, yeah, effectively. It's but not if you, really. If you have a different material with uh, different known thickness, so mass, or yeah. different known uh, coefficient of reflection. Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm not, not fully understanding the question. Um, okay, let's, let's chat afterwards. Yeah, we'll have a chat afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. The final paper in our session this afternoon uh, is on the subject of close proximity events in geosynchronous orbit. The presentation is by Patrick Lurch 
from Orbital ATK, and that's at least the second time I've mangled a name today. Um, so I owe somebody a favor. Thank you. All right, I'm going to be talking about re reconstructing close proximity events in geosynchronous orbit using sparse multi aspect or, uh, observations. And a little bit of background um, I work. Uh, for orbital at the um, at first space operations squadron in Colorado Springs. Um, so, as there's more sensors coming online that can produce observations from orbits like GEO, uh, how can we take advantage of that um, in order to produce more timely OD? All right. So. When we're trying to reconstruct close proximity events in GEO in a timely manner, uh, a lot of times there are very few OBS available. Uh, so traditional techniques like uh, Gooding's angles only, or if you have an a priority state using batch OD, uh, sometimes produces inconsistent results. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the observability of these uh, cases. Um, and but so what this technique does is take observations from the ground and from an observer in geo and tries to produce an OD, a reasonably accurate OD, very quickly um, using as few as two tracks. Uh, and the known state of a uh, known RSO that happens to be in the field of view. So using the known RSO, you can help to uh, reduce the search base and find a more accurate solution for your unknown object. So in order to do this, we made a number of uh, assumptions. Um, we assumed that we could correlate both of the RSOs. Uh, we had a good state for the known RSO, and that it was that both of the RSOs were in the field of view uh, of both the geo and the ground sensor that we were looking at. Um, we assumed that the unknown RSO, we don't have an a priori states, but the observations were correlated uh, to each other. So we, could, we knew that we were looking at the same thing with both observers. Uh, all the analysis was done with simulated data. Uh, we didn't use any real data here, and it was done in MATLAB with the uh, Java Astro Dynamics Toolkit. Um, so one thing to point out, and this is probably fairly obvious, is uh, if we quantify the observability of a ground observation and an observation from an observer in GEO, uh, ground observers have very good in-track observability when you uh, project that onto the RIC frame of the RSO that you're looking at. And they do not have very good radial observability. Now, a geo observer has very good radial observability, but very poor in-track observability. So in this technique, we take advantage of that um, in order to produce a better state. Um, so with traditional OD, you can compensate for this uh, by either doing it over a long time or having tons of observations. But uh, with this, we want to do it as quickly as possible. So as we're doing things with more congested environments and have to rapidly make decisions, uh, this allows us to uh, cut down the time to, uh, to a good orbit uh, very quickly. Um, so the methodology we used here uh, we estimated, we used the delta, so this, this cartoon kind of shows the, the geometry we're talking about. So we have a geo observer, ground observer, the known RSO, and the unknown RSO. So by using the delta angles from the known RSO to the unknown RSO from your OBS, and for the tracks we're talking about, we have four measurements separated by 15 seconds for each, each uh, track. Um, which is a very short arc as it's geo. And, uh, so what we do is assume that the unknown RSO uh, range is, in the, is perpendicular to the uh, vector from the uh, known RSO. So we're basically projecting the unknown, uh, unknown RSO line of sight vector onto the plane of the known RSO. And then uh, using range iteration to solve for the state of the uh, unknown RSO. And we estimate an initial position of the first track, the first observation and the last observation, then use Lambert's problem to 
solve for the velocities at each state. Um, we're doing that exhaustively, so we're, we're basically iterating through from minus 50 kilometers to positive 50 kilometers um, and solving for each one. Um, we then do a validity check on all of those results uh, to verify that it's in a, a reasonably close to geo orbit. Um, we check that the inclination is less than about 15 degrees and that if it has low eccentricity, and then it's not in anything crazy. Um, and then we take the minimum of the observation residuals, uh, uh, the mean angular error for the residuals across all the states. Uh, and that gives us our result. Um, uh, so to test this, we did a fairly preliminary test case. Uh, we did a number of different um, unknown RSO positions uh, to look at the types of conjunctions you would see at GEO. So we looked at a, if you had an inclined object coming close to an object you know about, uh, such as a comm satellite, um, there's, there's plenty of things since inclination grows. That's a fairly frequent case. Uh, we also looked at objects that were drifting and may come close to your object radially. Uh, so if you had a subsynchronous drifter, um, and then also uh, intrac, which would kind of represent things that are co-located in geo. Uh, we also looked at uh, a case where the objects were clustered, which is a, as we all know, a very difficult problem to solve uh, for OD. So, um, and some other cases we did, we did some sensitivity analysis on the longitude of the observer and also varying the time between observations. Uh, finally, we checked this technique using observations from a ground observer and a LEO observer. Um, so this plot here shows the um, altitude relative to geo, um, so zero being geosynchronous orbit, and then the longitude. So in this case, we have the known RSO at geo, the geo observer, and then the unknown RSO um, drifting away from the known RSO. So for the test cases that we, we've, where we varied the uh, position of the unknown RSO relative to the known RSO, um, we found we had pretty good results. So the, the uh, uh, positional error was on the order of several hundred meters, uh, and the velocity error was on the order of 20 or so centimeters per second. Um, and that was pretty much agnostic to where the uh, unknown RSO was in relation to the known RSO. Uh, we then looked at the effect of separating the observations in time. Um, this technique, we went from 30 seconds to an hour, and what ends up happening is the more separation you have, the better the velocity, uh, the less the velocity error is, so your positional error stays low. Um, so then it becomes a trade-off between whether you want to allow more time or whether you want to get the orbit state quickly. So I think that from around 10 to 15 minutes of separation between observations gives you the best results in this case as far as reconstructing a close proximity event. Uh, we then looked at uh, various positions for the uh, observer vehicle. Um, so in all these cases, we're using Diego Garcia as the ground site and a vehicle uh, 80 kilometers below geo. Um, and we varied the, varied the longitude of the observer uh, very, when it was very close, so we went from 2 degrees to 90 degrees, and in the closer cases, it seemed that the, uh, the errors were slightly increased. I believe this is due to the fact that the, uh, um, since we were basically below the target at that point, uh, the, the, uh, the observability wasn't as good in the radial component, so it reduced the accuracy. So there, in all these cases, there's a decently high positional and velocity error. It's not as good as what you'd get for a batch uh, over a long period of time or necessarily what somebody like EXO could provide. Um, but with current techniques, uh, in a lot of cases, you may have a situation where this is good enough. So if you need something that 
an orbit state that's good for you know zero to six hours in order to task other sensors, uh, this technique would work pretty well. Uh, so the final test case we did, we ran this uh, the same test using an observer in LEO, which uh, from the aspect of uh, geo orbit, a Leo, an observer in LEO is basically on the ground. So the observability is almost the same across the ground observer and the LEO observer. Uh, and in that case, the positional error uh, started off pretty well, but then grew extremely quickly. So that orbit wouldn't really be useful for uh, making a decision. Um, so, in summary, um, this is a technique we'd probably use uh, when you're trying to rapidly make decisions if you have some information that suggests that something's close to your RSO and either you have a handful of OBS um, from a geo observer or ground observer or you've tasked, a, tasked those sensors. Um, and as geo becomes more and more congested, I think this will be very useful. If there's any questions?